Well, good morning and welcome to Jacksonville Presbyterian Church. If this is your first Sunday, we're going through the Gospel of John together through this year, and we are into John chapter 9, uh, which to me personally is a very significant chapter uh, for my own life and testimony. Uh, but we're only going to spend today on this chapter. Uh, I could probably spend a whole month in John chapter 9, but we're going to be looking at it just today, and next week we'll pick up in John chapter 10. Uh, before we jump into uh, John chapter 9, though, uh, I, 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 wanna, I just want to give you a, an image in my head of the dream church. So just, you know, humor your pastor for just like five seconds. Uh, this, is, this is any pastor's dream. Uh, it comes from Acts chapter 2, uh, which is why we have things called Acts 2 groups, uh, to give you sort of a taste of what this kind of community would be like. In Acts chapter 2, this is, I think, God's dream church community. It says this in Acts chapter 2, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together, and breaking bread in their homes. They received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Um, Friends, there is so much about a beautiful Christian community. Every (laughs) pastor that I know that loves the Lord daydreams about a church community like that. Uh, People breaking bread in each other's homes, uh, being in small groups, uh, taking the breaking of bread in communion, devoting themselves to prayer and generosity to the poor. And then what I love most about it is the first thing they do in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, is they devote themselves to the apostles' teaching. And friends, that's exactly what you and I are about to do. We are going to devote ourselves to the apostle John's teaching. This is the apostles' teaching. And I hope you read John chapter 9 uh, right now with me as if you were devoting your very self to understanding and seeing Jesus and what he has to say in his word. Uh, Friend, I implore you, devote yourself to this apostle's teaching. And with that in mind, Christian, hear God's word in John chapter 9, the whole chapter. As he passed by, that is Jesus, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night's coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, Jesus spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It's he. Others said, No, but he's like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Well, where is he then? He said, I don't know. They brought the man to the Pharisees, who had formerly been blind. Now, it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes, so the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man's not from God, for he doesn't keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who's a sinner do such signs? And there was division among them. So they said again to the blind man, what did you say about him? What do you say about him since he opened your eyes? The man said, he's a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, we know that this is our son, And that he was born blind. 
But how he now sees, we don't know. Nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he's of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he's of age, ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, whether he's a sinner, I don't know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I've already told you, and, would you, and you would not listen why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? <laughs> and they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this guy, we don't know where he comes from. The man answered, Why, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man weren't from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born in other sin, and would you teach us? And so they cast him out. Jesus heard that they cast him out, and having found him, Jesus said, do you believe in the Son of Man. He answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to Jesus, Are we also blind? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you wouldn't have guilt. But now that you say, we see, your guilt remains. Friends, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will endure forever. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Would you be seated? Thank you for standing up so long. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, Lord, we pray uh, by the power of your Holy Spirit uh, that we would see Jesus and not divert our eyes away from him. Amen. Uh, friends, have you ever found yourself um, diverting your eyes away from someone with disabilities? Have you ever found yourself, you know, sort of smiling and looking down at the ground, uh, hoping that that person with disabilities or the person with Down syndrome uh, may not catch your eye? Uh, have you ever found yourself, you know, subtly avoiding people with disabilities? Um, not sure what they'll expect of you or what they'll need from you, or what in the world they may ask of you. You know, when we see people with disabilities, it can often strike us as a major inconvenience, uh, or simply maybe just an encounter that we don't know how to anticipate, or one that we don't know how we're going to get out of. Uh, yeah, have you ever found yourself seeing someone with disabilities and not seeing them? Uh, you know, what I want you to notice first off in John chapter 9 is that uh, this is primarily a passage about Jesus' ministry uh, to people with disabilities. Uh, look right there in verse 9, 1 and following. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And I don't want you to think that's a throwaway line. Uh, Jesus has just gotten done uh, declaring that before Abraham was, I am. He just got uh, done having a heated argument with people about who he is, and Jesus declared that he was fully divine, uh, that he wasn't just a, a prophet, he was more than a prophet. Yeah, he spoke on behalf of God, but he also says that I am, meaning that he is the Lord himself come to save us all. Uh, but what's amazing about that as, you know, sort of, you know, angry and frustrated as that whole interaction seems to have been, uh, in verse 9 what we find immediately is as he leaves that sort of heated conversation Notice who he sees. Verse 9-1, as Jesus, as, as if he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And what I love about this story, friends, is uh, if, you, if you read the Bible carefully, you'll notice uh, in John chapter 9, we never actually hear this blind man asking Jesus anything. 
Um, a lot of times when it came to the miraculous healings of Jesus, somebody would come up to him and say, you know, son of David, son of David, have mercy on us. Or there'd be a Roman centurion uh, with, a, with a huge crisis saying, come help, help me and help my family or help my man. And instead what happens here is that Jesus sees him first. And in fact, the man never asks Jesus to heal him. And in fact, the man doesn't believe in Jesus at this point, which is important because the man doesn't come to faith in Jesus until the end of the story. That's the whole point of John chapter 9. A man encounters Jesus, is blessed by Jesus, but has yet to put his faith in Jesus until he fully sees him for who he is. That's the whole big reveal at the end of the story. So the first thing I want you to realize, uh, friends, is that as we focus this whole uh, next few months on the theme of seeing Jesus, uh, what I want you to see in John chapter 9 is I want you to see Jesus seeing others. Let me say that again. I want you to see Jesus as he sees others. I want you to see Jesus seeing people with disabilities. And right off the bat, what I want you to see is it was Jesus, not the disciples, not the apostles. It wasn't this man calling out to Jesus for help. It was Jesus who saw him first. Friends, how do you see people with disabilities? Do you see them or do you see past them? You know, uh, I, had a, I had a great mentor in college, uh, excuse me, in seminary. Uh, his name was Derek Thomas. He was Welsh, like Pastor Richard, you know, so everything he said sounds more profound when it comes with a Welsh accent. You know, I could tell you, love Jesus, and you'd be like, yeah, maybe. I'd be like, love Jesus, and you'd be like, whoa, I'm going to do whatever the Welsh guy just said, right? They always sound more profound. You know, I sound, you know I'm like, love Jesus, y'all. That doesn't really convince anybody. <laughs> The Welsh accent gives you like 10 points on your IQ score. Southern, you drop about 15 or 20, right? <laughs> well, what I love about uh, Derek Thomas, uh, Derek W.H. Thomas, he actually has come to Cornerstone several times and given lectures. Uh, he's widely published. Maybe you've heard of him. His name is Derek Thomas. Uh, he's, a, he's a scholar. And uh, anyway, he was my main professor in seminary, and I spent two years in a prayer group with Derek Thomas. And uh, anyway, years later, after I had graduated, I, I came to his church, First Presbyterian Church of Jackson, uh, this huge sort of mega church. And I, I listened to him preach one Sunday and hadn't seen him in a couple of years. And I uh, came up to him after the service and wanted to reconnect with my mentor, right? Uh, except there was this interesting uh, occurrence that happened, which is as soon as I walked up to him, a young woman with Down syndrome walked in front of me and hugged Derek Thomas. And as I came up to Derek, I tried to get his attention, but Derek's full attention was on this woman with Down syndrome. And, you know, after a minute or two of them interacting, he noticed me and kind of gave me like a little bit of a wave, you know, and uh, I kind of waved at him and he kept his attention on this young woman with Down syndrome who just couldn't stop hugging him. And finally, I just walked up and started talking to him and all of his attention was on this a uh, woman with Down syndrome, and uh, I tried to talk to him and give him an update on my life, and he just sort of dismissed my life update, which I didn't have much of one by then, and instead he introduced me to the woman with Down syndrome and encouraged me to talk to her and engage her in our conversation, and so we did, and I kind of awkwardly didn't know how to interact, and so I, I kind of talked to the girl with Down syndrome, and uh, you know, friends, it always struck me uh, that Derek Thomas's, the, the reason he was my mentor was because he had an eye for people with disabilities. And, uh, you know, by God's providence, the beautiful thing is, is five years ago when my wife and I had our son Levi, I named our son Levi Thomas after Derek Thomas. And now, as many of you know, my son has mental disabilities. But I first learned and saw someone seeing disabled people when I saw Derek Thomas hugging that Down syndrome girl. What a beautiful move of God's providence. So I guess what I want you to see uh, as we look at this story of a miraculous healing, friends, uh, primarily is I want you to be the kind of person. I want you to be the kind of Christian that sees people 
with disabilities and you don't see through them or you see past them, you see them. You see them. As Jesus passed by, he saw him. He saw him and he dignified him. Uh, Friends, this is what it means to be conformed into the image of his son, uh, which Romans 8 says that you and I were predestined to be conformed into the image of Jesus. Uh, Friends, what that means is your eyes are predestined before the foundations of the earth to see differently than the people around you. Your eyes are being molded and shaped by the light of Christ to see more and more people who may have nothing to offer you, or so you think. Uh, Friends, do you see people like Jesus? I mean, we really, really, really struggle with people with disabilities. Um, Even the disciples don't know how to interact with people with disabilities. Um, And also, friends, this is the the only miraculous healing uh, in the Gospel of John uh, that was congenital. Uh, that was not um, induced by something. And so um, whenever people are in suffering, you know, we always want to know why. Why are people suffering this way? So look at verse 2. The disciples come up to Jesus, and they say, Rabbi, they're talking to Jesus, right? Teacher, that's what rabbi means, teacher. Jesus, rabbi, teach us. Um, Who sinned, (laughs) this guy or his parents? And I say guy because uh, there isn't a pronoun there. It actually does refer to guy. And any time the Pharisees later on say, who is this man? They mean it derogatorily. And they say, well, this dude, you know, who is this guy? Did he mess up or was it his his parents? And uh, what they're referring to right there in the ancient Near Eastern world, and especially in Judaism, was a belief that all suffering... Um, any, anything that could cause you to suffer, whether it's a physical ailment or it's a disease or anything negative in your life, has to be the result of sin. And there is a, a sense that um, that is true, right? Sin entered the world, as Romans 5 explains and as Genesis 3 explains. As sin enters the world, it causes this world to be broken and for our bodies to be broken and to be infected with sin, both um, you know, spiritually and physically. So yeah, there is a link between sin and suffering. But what they pushed that belief to the ultimate extreme to is they said, every instance of you suffering has to be the result of you specifically sinning. So if you are suffering or you have a physical disability or you have an ailment or you've gone blind or you've gone deaf or you're mentally handicapped, it has to have been because you sinned at some point. Or maybe your mom sinned when you were in her womb. Who sinned? This guy or somebody in his family? And notice how uh, Jesus answers that. He says, (laughs) he basically says, no, no, you are wrong. It, this guy didn't sin, and neither did his parents, and that's not why he is suffering. And I know that sounds kind of like far-fetched, uh, you know, that who would ever say that to such a person? Uh, but friends, I would encourage you, as you talk to people with disabilities, um, ask them sometime if they have ever been told by a Christian that they are being punished. Um, I can guarantee you, more often than not, the answer will be yes. Yes. Um, I, can te- I can do a personal testimony. I can give a witness. I have had people tell me my son was struck with cerebral palsy because of the sin that my wife and I committed. And the, the, the hard thing, friend, is I, you, know, you would think that a pastor would know that that is a lie. But, friends, if you've got a wound on your soul, it doesn't matter who pokes it. It's still a wound. And if you know somebody who's blind or deaf or in a wheelchair or has a child with Down syndrome... I can probably bet that someone in their life has told them it's because their child sinned or they sinned. It's happening in Jesus' life, and it still happens today. Why does this happen? So what are we supposed to see in this story? Well, this is a notoriously hard verse to translate. Um, You know, why does suffering happen? Well, Jesus says very clearly in 9.3 that it's not because this man was a sinner, nor was it because his parents sinned in some kind of egregious way. And in fact, uh, yes, sin does infect the world, but your personal suffering doesn't have to be because you are a sinner or God is punishing you. Um, yeah, like if you, you know, get drunk and you drive your car and you ran into a tree, yeah, that's your fault and you sinned and that's obvious. But every time you suffer, 
there's not an always absolute guarantee it's because God is trying to punish you for your sin, right? I think that's what Jesus is getting at. So how do we understand this sentence? It's not because they sinned, but it's so that, look at verse 3, but so that, for the purpose of, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Now, um, there, that's a notoriously hard sentence to always know because some Christians want to say, well, God would never strike a child with disability. Um, and then some people would say, well, yeah, God's in charge of everything and God has providence and God allowed this to happen. Uh, but what I want you to notice about how Jesus answers that question is he doesn't really look backward. The disciples are looking at this man and they want to look backward. They want to know what was the root cause of the problem. They want to look backwards in history and tie his blindness to something that happened to him in the past or something that he did in the past. Um, that's what they want to focus on. How did this happen? Why did this happen? But notice how Jesus answers the question. Jesus does not look backward he dismisses that question outright. He just says, no, you're both wrong. It's not him or his parents. No, but Jesus sees forward in this man's life. Do you see that? He says, it's not that this man sinned or his parents, but Jesus looks forward. And he says, what does this man's life have in store he says, this has happened so that the works of God will be displayed, might be revealed, might be seen in him. So friends, what I want you to see simply is when you are faced with disability or your family member, um, you know, something, some, somewhere around 516 million people on the planet are affected by disability. Um, it's a huge number of people affected by uh, disability, right? And then you got to add more people who just have regular old diseases, right, and suffering. Uh, this is a huge population of our uh, humanity. So why is it that it's happening? Why did God allow this to happen to me? Well, unfortunately, Jesus' answer may not be totally satisfying because he doesn't really focus on why. Instead, what Jesus focuses on is, look what God is going to do in this suffering. What is God going to do about it? God is going to reveal his works. And so what Jesus does, uh, you know, famously, right, is he, he stoops down and he spits in the ground, which is weird. And if you think it's weird, you are right. It is weird. It's the only time Jesus does something this weird. And all the commentators are all agreed it's pretty weird. You know, it's hard to know exactly what he's doing. They're all kind of colorful explanations for why Jesus spat in the mud. You know, was he confirming the medical practices of the day? Probably not. You know, is he doing it to sort of recreate Genesis because he made man out of, you know, the dirt of the ground and so now he's putting the dirt on his eyes to recreate eyes? I don't know. Hard to say. Um, we have a lot of questions of the Bible. The Bible is just totally uninterested to answer. Doesn't say why he spat in the ground. But it is gross. It mentions the spit and the spittle in the Greek, which is fun. I don't know if saliva strikes you any better, but it's pretty odd. <laughs> Spits in the ground. If nothing else, Jesus is just interesting, right? That's like, the, at the minimal, that's a cool takeaway, right? This is pretty cool, right? And so Jesus, you know, also notice that Jesus hadn't said anything to the man yet. Remember, the man hasn't asked Jesus for the healing. What happens is Jesus has the kind of eyes that see people with disabilities. That's the kind of person he is, right? because he's the Lord of compassion, and he sees this man, and the disciples want to blame that ailment on some kind of sin, and Jesus says, no, but look what God's going to do in the midst of this suffering. God's going to get some glory. And so then he spits on the ground, makes some mud, walks up to the man, puts on his eyes, and says, I'm going to send you over to the pool of scent, and you are going to wash, and you're going to be healed. And so the man gets up and walks away, and he's healed. And, you know, we could spend, you know, like I said, weeks on this story because there's all kind of wonderful sort of, you know, Jewish uh, sort of uh, Jewish humor all throughout this passage, right? Like, especially that sort of witty line where the guy's like, oh, you're asking me now a third time, like, how this happened? Do you want to become his disciples too? I do. Do you want to join me? You want to be disciples of Jesus, right? If that didn't strike you as funny, you're missing the humor in the Bible. That's about as funny as it gets. So, you know, you may need to lower your expectations some. I think that's hilarious, right? So he goes back and forth with these guys, and you know, there's this whole question about who is Jesus, 
And uh, what's really, really beautiful about it is, you know, he doesn't really see Jesus fully until Jesus seeks him out again. I don't know if you noticed that, but notice how much Jesus pursues people, right? The man doesn't ask for healing. Jesus sees him. And then when the man is rejected by the religious leaders and loses his community, Jesus finds him. He doesn't find Jesus. Jesus finds him. And he says, now do you want to believe in the Son of Man? And he says, absolutely. Lord, I believe. So how are we supposed to sort of see forward? So I'm suggesting to you that I want you to see the disabled the way Jesus would. Don't see past them. See them. And now what I want you to consider is you are to see forward. Um, it's so easy to look at you know, ailments or kids uh, with disabilities or kids on the spectrum, and it's really easy to blame their parents, right? Anyone ever blamed parents on misbehaving kids? Really easy to blame parents. Really easy to blame the kids, right? Really easy to think, well, God must be really mad at them. Or where is a good God in the midst of this suffering? Uh, but remember, there's a whole book of the Bible devoted to this very question, right? It's Job. It's like literally an entire book of the Bible is devoted to why do the good suffer? So Jesus isn't providing any sort of new teaching, right? He's just affirming the teaching of the Old Testament, right? God has his purposes. We don't always see them, but God has his purposes. But what does it mean for you and I to sort of see forward? Uh, well, what I want you to grasp, friend, is that so much of the Christian life is sort of meant to be oriented towards a goal. And uh, whether you realize it or not, we all sort of have goals that our lives are oriented towards. You know, um, remember that great movie, Pirates of the Caribbean? And whenever uh, Jack Sparrow holds a, this magic compass, the compass points to what he wants most. You know, it's such an apt illustration of how we operate, right? Our lives are always pointing to what we want most. And what we want most determines where we end up in life. But the craziest thing for us Christians to believe in America is that what we are supposed to want most, where the arrow of our heart is supposed to point, is not in this world. Or let me rephrase it. Where your heart is supposed to yearn is in this world made new. It is in the new heavens and the new earth. It is in, as the old Jewish prophets used to say, and as Peter says in Acts 3, we look forward to the restoration of all things. We look forward to the new heavens and the new earth when God will dwell again with his people and that the heavenly Jerusalem will be reunited with this earthly world. And as Revelation ends with, he will wipe away every tear from our eyes and he who sits on the throne will declare, I am making all things new. So when Jesus performs miracles, when he gives sight to the blind, when he raises the dead, when he casts out the demons, he's not just showing off. What he's doing is he's showing us what it looks like to yearn for the new kingdom, the new world, when everything will be made new when those who are in wheelchairs will run faster marathons than you, when those who are mentally disabled will sing the praises of God forever, when those who are dead will rise to the clouds to meet Jesus and they'll live forever. You see, friends, this is why God is near the brokenhearted, I think, because the brokenhearted know that the ultimate goal is not in this world. It's when Jesus returns and makes all things new. And he wipes away every tear from every eye of every mother who's ever had to watch their child suffer. Are you starting to see why the new heavens and the new earth, why heaven is the hope for the broken? See, this is what it means, Christian, to see forward. Because if you know that whatever disability or suffering you're facing one day you are going to be fully restored. What that does is it allows you to endure suffering here and now because you've set your hope on God and on nothing else. And yes, God heals people miraculously. Obviously, he heals this guy miraculously. And God can certainly heal people today. And that gives God glory. But you know what else gives God glory? 
when his grace is made perfect in our weakness. And when we suffer, and when we are blind from birth until death, and we cry out with Job, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And he sustains us. And that gives him glory. Do you see the disabled the way Jesus sees them? Do you see forward? <laughs> Does any part of your heart, I mean, just don't think about yourself for like 10 seconds of your life, <laughs> right? Imagine what the new heavens and the new earth are going to be like for everyone who has a broken body in this life. Imagine what it's going to mean when Jesus fulfills the restoration of all things. Hebrews 13 says it this way, friends, we have no lasting city here, but we seek the city that is to come. We seek the new Jerusalem, Mount Zion, when all peoples from tribes, nations, languages, and tongues, when the able and the disabled rejoice at the God who has saved them. This is what it means, friends, to see forward to the power of our God. Let me just finish with this. I hope you see disabled people the way Jesus does. I hope you're that kind of person. I hope you start to see forward. <laughs> you know, I, I hope you start to have sort of um, what some may call the poor man's hope. I hope you start to hope for the restoration of all things. And lastly, friends, I want you to see Jesus the way this guy does. Remember, he doesn't come to faith immediately. He's experienced blessings from Jesus. I mean, Jesus has literally healed him, but he doesn't believe yet. He's close to the kingdom, but he doesn't believe until he sees Jesus face to face. When he's been kicked out, and he says, Lord, who is the son of man that I can believe in him? And at that moment, he falls down and worships Jesus. And he just says two words, Lord, I believe. Curiae pistuo. I believe. Friends, that's what it means to see Jesus. It means you fall down and worship him as Lord. And if you don't ever fall down, John ends with this sort of ominous warning, right? Jesus says he's the light of the world, come to give sight to the blind. And if you have eyes to see the light, you see him fully and you fall down and worship him as God. But as soon as the blind man sees Jesus and comes to faith, the shining, brilliant light is so overwhelming that the Pharisees become blinded by the light of Jesus. And they can't see him. And Jesus says, your pride keeps you from seeing me, and your guilt remains. Uh, friends, that's the invitation. Do you see Jesus? Do you see him? Let's pray. And Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, we thank you that you have seen each one of us. And Lord, give us eyes of compassion. Uh, Lord, would you uh, orient the compasses of our heart to yearn for the new world when you return? Uh, Lord, we thank you for your sustaining grace for those who are suffering in this